who is canine interventional disc disease? What is it and how much do we know? And, and more specifically about uh, one project that we're doing within this much broader scheme, uh, which is on the recovery of ambulation in medically managed non-ambulatory small breed dogs with thoracolumbar interventional disc herniation. And I know that sounds like a huge number of very, very long and complicated words, but by the end of this uh, this talk, I'm very confident that everyone here will understand 100% of those things uh, and hopefully will be very excited about them. What I'm gonna do today is, first of all, I'm gonna start with a little bit of a, a recap for anyone who was here for our last talk. Uh, this will be stuff we've already covered, but mainly what is a disc, uh, how does it go wrong, and, and what happens when it does go wrong, and a few definitions just to make sure we're all on the same page. And then after that, uh, a little bit more of an interactive run through a few cases and, and what we've learned uh, from seeing those cases uh, in the last uh, seven months that we've been doing this project. Uh, and then at the end, I'm just going to talk a little bit about uh, some of the other stuff that we're doing at the Cambridge IVPD Research Group um, and how we're going to be going forwards in the future to hopefully learn a little bit more about, uh, about the disease. So, to cap off, uh, what is a disc? Well, uh, if you imagine that your spine is made up of little building blocks, so little bones, each of those is called vertebra. Uh, and uh, when each of those move, if we had nothing in between, you would just have bone on bone, which would be a very effective joint. Uh, it would also be pretty painful. So what the body has done rather sensibly is put a little shock absorber in between each and every one of those. Uh, and that's essentially what the disc is. It has two parts to it so that it can have that function. One is the outer bit, which is very fibrous. It's sort of lots of little strands of, of collagen all wound around together, making it really, really very, very strong. Uh, and then an inner bit, which uh, is very gel-like, and that actually gives it its shock absorbing capacity. I put two pictures here, and the one on the left is you know, relatively obvious, hopefully. It's a nice, uh, demonstration of an actual disc with the, with the two bits pointed out there. I don't know if you can see my cursor, uh, but the annulus fibrosis is this outer tough bit that uh, is, is giving it the kind of strength and holding it in situ. Uh, the nucleus pulposus is this real gel-like bit. The second picture is possibly a bit more abstract, but again, those of you who have spoken to me in the past will know that not only do I love jam donuts, um, I also love the analogy of a jam donut for a disc. It, it's a really great analogy that we'll come back to a little bit later as well, because what is a jam donut? It's an, it's an outer bit that is holding in a filling, and that filling is, is kind of gel-like. It's the jam, and so uh, a lot of the time I, I'm going to spend talking about discs. I'm actually going to be referring to jam donuts instead. Um, which is going to make me awfully hungry, um, but hopefully will make it really clear for everyone what it is that I'm on about. So if we imagine a disc, uh, what happens when it goes wrong? Well, uh, first of all, the first process is as dogs get older, the disc starts to degenerate. Uh, and this is kind of equivalent to leaving your jam donut out on the side in the kitchen for several days your jam donut stops being quite so spongy. In a bit, the jam as well starts to become crystallized. And that is essentially the process of degeneration of the disc. It, the, the inner bit becomes less gel-like, it becomes mineralized and less able to absorb the forces uh, when dogs are moving. At this point, it becomes more prone to problems. And the exact link between these two things is not fully elucidated, but we do know that in order to have a problem such as this, it all starts with the process of degeneration. What happens when it's no longer able to withstand those forces? Well, unfortunately, the jam gets squeezed out of the donut, and we'll come back to what exactly that means in just a second. Before we move on, I would like to just start with some definitions to make sure that we're all using the same terminology to refer to the same thing uh, because there's lots of different words for this out there there's lots of different uh, metaphors and, and euphemisms if you like um, 
but I think it's important that we all understand exactly what it is that we're referring to when we're talking about each specific thing. So to start with intervertebral disc disease, we use this almost interchangeably with, with some of the other things when perhaps we shouldn't really because it's actually an umbrella term. It, it's kind of all encompassing. It encompasses the overall process of disc degeneration and any problem associated with that. And, and in theory, actually, it also would cover disc spondylitis, which is an infection of the disc too. So it's really not very specific. It's an umbrella term. Um, so it's, it's important that we understand that that's what we mean when we're talking about intervertebral disc disease in general. Intervertebral disc herniation. So this is essentially a term that means where part of the intervertebral disc is poking out or, or pushing or impinging upon the spinal cord. And there's a few different ways that that can happen. And there's one very particular one that we're going to be talking about. But again, this is kind of an umbrella term. It's more specific than intervertebral disc disease because it doesn't include the process purely of degeneration or infection of the disc but it does include multiple different types of disease, many of which are treated differently, appear differently. Uh, so it's important to recognize that this again is an umbrella term. So this is the specific thing that we're gonna be talking about today. And this is the specific one that we worry about uh, in, in Daxies uh, and in other dogs, uh, intervertebral disc extrusions. Uh, and this is where the jam donut or so some people like to use the toothpaste tube analogy works very well because it's where the inside uh, the jam is squeezed out of the donut and it's the jam that is then causing our, our, our problems essentially. Uh, another question we get quite frequently is what is conservative management? What is medical management? Well, these are two interchangeable terms. And essentially, it means any treatment regime that doesn't involve surgery. Um, so actually, it could encompass a lot of things. But in this specific example, when we're talking about intervertebral disc extrusions, which we're talking about this evening, it always consists of at least three things. So that would be pain relief, very strict cage rest, physiotherapy, and if required, often bladder management as well. I've also added this one on for those of you who were at our last webinar. This is an extra definition for you all to get your head around um, because I've seen this a lot in various different groups being discussed. And I think there's often a slight misconception about what it means. Fenestration, it comes from the French word fenestre. So for those of you who know, that means window and that's exactly what we do. So it's a surgical technique where a window is made into the disc little hole is made in the outside of the jam donut and, and you scoop out as much of the jam as possible. Uh, and this can be done both as a treatment, but much more commonly is done prophylactically to try to prevent future disc herniation. Uh, I don't want anyone to worry about it too much. I just wanted to add it in there because I've seen it around a lot uh, and I think there's a bit of a misconception about what it means. Great. So. Once again, I wanted a nice uh, visual demonstration. You may be learning already from these slides that I'm a pretty visual learner. So uh, there's gonna be lots of pictures involved in this. Uh, and, and as you can see, so these are both types of intervertebral disc herniation. So as I said, they're umbrella terms. Uh, disc protrusion on the left, ignore that one. We're not gonna be talking about that anymore today. Uh, disc extrusion, this is the one that we're really focusing on today. And it's where the jam, the nucleus bulbosus has been squeezed out of the donut. Uh, and, and the spinal cord is the big yellow thing here. So intervertebral disc extrusions in a little bit more focus in a little bit more detail. Uh, what exactly are they uh, and, and, and what kind of problems do they cause? So we have a hardened disc. This then explodes out and it collides with the spinal cord. And because the spinal cord is held in place, it's within just a bony canal. It can't move away. Uh, it's got nowhere to go. And so this movement of the jam coming out of the donut does two things. It causes a contusive injury, a bruising injury where it hits the spinal cord. And then some of the jam remains there and compresses it. And each individual disc is a unique combination and interaction of these two things. 
no disc extrusion is the same as another, even within the same dog. It's done at different speeds, at different volume. They are completely different. Uh, and so that's part of the challenge really for, for, for us as vets to try to get on top of this because every single one is unique, but it all boils down to these two things causing their problem and interacting between the two. So once again, a bit of a visual representation for everybody. What it does is it hits it, it bruises it, and then it compresses it, okay? Uh, and I think that's, a, if we all get that image in our head of a, a jam donut being squeezed, the jam hitting, bruising, and compressing, then we have a pretty good understanding of what an interactive disc extrusion is. Now we know what it is, who gets them? Uh, well, it happens in any dog, actually. There's, there's any dog is capable of getting this, but they're much more common in dogs that we would term chondrodystrophic. This is a very, very long word, but essentially, if you think of dogs who are little and low, you, you won't be far wrong. So obviously, Daxies are in their corgis, basset hounds. Uh, the two that maybe won't spring to most people's minds, but are very, very commonly affected would be Cocker Spaniels and Beagles as well. Uh, but any dog uh, of any age really can actually be affected by an interactive disc extrusion. The average age is, is around five years. And the reason for this is because it physically takes time for degeneration to happen. And without degeneration, you can't have an interactive disc extrusion. It would be a completely different problem that you would have. Um, and so that's the reason why the average age is around five. But from about a year of age, it can happen. And we certainly do see it uh, in, in dogs that are you know, from two years of age, maybe slightly younger even. Um, but on average, it's, it's middle-aged dogs that would tend to be affected purely because of this process of degeneration. One of the scary things, especially for uh, anybody who, like me, is a Daxi owner, uh, the miniature Dachshund is probably the most commonly affected, and it happens in around 20% of all miniature Dachshunds. Uh, and in one relatively recent study, uh, it was fatal in 25% of those. So 5% of every miniature vaccine that you meet in your life will die as a result of interventional disc disease. Um, and certainly some of those are, are, are dying directly as a result of it, but a lot of them are being put to sleep because of the perception that they may have a poor prognosis, which is something we will come back to uh, later and something we're, we're kind of fighting to change. What does it look like? Well, if you go back to what I was saying before about each one being quite unique, you can kind of imagine that actually the signs can be pretty variable too. And partly it depends on where you're affected. And for the purpose of today, we'll be focusing on dogs who are affected in the middle of their back. So their back legs are the ones that are affected because this is by far and away the most common. Uh, and pretty much always the signs will start pretty suddenly and normally they're, they're progressive at the beginning. They'll normally progress over the first couple of days. And they can range anywhere from just back pain, uh, and often just being a little lethargic, unwilling to jump, uh, to complete paralysis and loss of, uh, loss of feeling, and something we would call loss of deep pain perception. So that's where they, they can't tell whether you're thinking really very hard on their toes. So what happens next? We, we have a dog who has gone off of their legs uh, and we suspect that they have suffered an intervertebral disc extrusion. Well, there's multiple ways of managing them and they generally will fall into two categories. One will be surgical management and one will be conservative management. And I want to focus a little bit on, on surgical management first so that we understand the context that we're, we're coming from with our, with our study. So it seems logical that where we have a compressive problem, we should remove the compression, right? We can see it, we can go and do something about it. It's kind of basic human instinct that we would like to go and do that. And especially this is the case when there's actual, actually no drugs that have been developed to help with the other side of things, the contusive bruising injury. So compression is kind of the, the obvious one to focus on because it's the only one we can do anything about. Um, and so it definitely seems logical that we should remove the compression. 
Uh, and that's exactly what people tend to do. And uh, over 50 years ago now, uh, procedures were introduced to go in surgically and remove the compression. And, and that surgery has been very, very successful over a very prolonged period of time. Uh, in fact, its success has even got to the point where now there is a perception that if you're in the most severely affected categories, that you, you probably do require surgery and that there really isn't any other option. And that would be the perception of most, uh, not just owners, but vets and, and often even a lot of neurologists as well. And given just how successful surgical management has been, it, it, it's becoming increasingly difficult for them to manage cases in a non-surgical way uh, because surgery is so overwhelmingly successful. Just to kind of give you some numbers up for that, uh, for dogs who are grade one to four, way over 90% of dogs will recover if they have surgical management. On the flip side, we do know that many severely affected dogs will improve with conservative non-surgical management. The problem is there's been no formal clinical trials comparing surgical and non-surgical management to date, despite the fact that we've been doing it for over 50 years, which is slightly scary. Uh, and because of that, there's no robust criteria to distinguish who absolutely requires surgery and has no way of getting better if they don't have surgery and who have a pretty good opportunity of getting better with, with, with conservative management. It's probably not possible to do that anymore. The success of surgery is so overwhelming that where it's possible to do surgery, we, we kind of have to do it because we know that it goes so well. And so we have to kind of think of other ways that we can try to make this comparison and try to come up with some criteria to decide who, who needs it and how to direct it a little bit more successfully than we are at the moment. That's kind of where we come in at Cambridge. So if we go back to our statistics that 5% of all miniature dachshunds will be put to sleep as a result of intervertebral disc disease, that's far too many. And, and a lot of them are being put to sleep potentially unnecessarily because of this perception that they require surgery. And if they can't have surgery, that that's kind of it for them. But equally so, we can't just do a randomized controlled trial as you would see often in human medicine where you're randomly assigned to groups and, and, and uh, you're put in one or the other and that's just the way that you go completely randomly and we see what happens we have to be a little bit more pragmatic about it so what we're doing is we're looking for dogs who have become unable to walk on their back legs uh, and are suspected to have had intervertebral disc extrusion so have been to their vets uh, and their vets are very highly suspicious that they've suffered an intervertebral disc extrusion and that last little bit there who cannot afford surgeries is very important that's very important because of the success of surgery. Um, where it's possible, we still have to recommend it. That hopefully will change when we finish the project, but uh, for the time being, that's an important, important thing to, to, to note. What do we offer? Well, we offer a consultation here at, at, at the University of Cambridge Hospital, the Queen's Vet School Hospital, uh, a full neurological examination. And if we think that an intervertebral disc extrusion is still the most likely uh, and often we do agree with your vets, uh, then we go ahead and we do an MRI. It's, it's just under sedation, it's a very, very quick MRI. It only takes around 20 minutes uh, just to confirm the diagnosis of a disc extrusion. Uh, because what we wouldn't want to do is subject a dog to conservative management who, who does not have one, because that just wouldn't be fair. We then assist with 12 weeks medical management. So as I said before, that involves rest, pain relief, physiotherapy, bladder management, and we adjust this over the 12 weeks, depending on how, how things progress. Uh, and we've had to move this remotely because of, because of COVID. At the end of 12 weeks, we come back and essentially do it all again. We do another consultation, we do another neurological examination, and we do another MRI. And, and this allows us at that point to make a much more long-term plan of attack uh, for the individual dog. We can put all of that together, the progression over the 12 weeks, where they're at, what we see in the neurological examination in the MRI, um, and from there make a really nice long-term plan. What we're hoping to, to, to show, we're hoping to show people the actual proportion of dogs who get better without surgery uh, for all of the grades, and, and perhaps most importantly, those who are really severely affected, who have lost their deep pain perception. 
and also start to come up with some criteria that will help us predict which dogs absolutely need surgery and who do not, so that we can target surgery only at those who absolutely require it. How is it going so far? So we've been going since October and we've been overwhelmed really with the response from people. It's been absolutely fabulous. We've had so much interest. Uh, and so far we've, we've been able to include 19 dogs, uh, six of the 19 being grade five. Before I go a little bit further, I just want to talk a little bit about the grading system. So throughout this uh, presentation, I'll be using the grading system grades one to five, with grade one being dogs who have back pain alone, grade two being back pain and some neurological deficits. Uh, so for example, not knowing where their legs are um, and being a little bit uncoordinated when they walk, but still being capable of walking. Grade three being the same, but being unable to walk. Grade four being complete paralysis of the hind limbs and grade five being paralysis and no deep pain perception. So that's where we pinch on their toes and we don't see any response from the front end. So we have included 19 dogs, six of the 19 have been grade five. And so far, out of the 13 dogs who retain deep pain perception, 12 have recovered the ability to walk within 12 weeks. And the one dog who has not is very early on in the process and we have very high hopes for. Uh, they are still less than four weeks into their recovery period. So it's perhaps unfair to call them a uh, unsuccessful outcome at this point in time because we would be very, very hopeful. So all 12 of the dogs who have gone through the uh, complete 12 week period and have been grades three or four have, have recovered the ability to walk. Of the six dogs who are who were deep pain negative when they came to us, four of them have recovered the ability to walk within 12 weeks. Now, these numbers may not seem particularly crazy to people, but just to put a little bit of context into it. So the reported success rate for grades three and four is 86 percent. And we're talking about here potentially 100 percent if we ignore the one dog who has not completed the 12 week uh, program yet. And the reported success rate for dogs who are grade five and have conservative management is 6%. And we're talking here potentially about a recovery rate of 66%. So that's quite a stark difference. That's quite uh, something really. The average time taken to recover the ability to walk is also pretty quick as well. So we give them 12 weeks um, to show that. In fact, even afterwards, we still follow them to see what's happening. Um, but the average time taken to return to, to walking is, is 17 and a half days. So it's actually pretty rapid, uh, two and a half weeks. Um, so, so not really that much time at all. I just thought uh, to hammer home the point that this is pretty shocking. This is a massive, massive change in what we were anticipating, really. Uh, it just shows that the, the data that we have, the historical data that we have, uh, is just not fit for purpose at the moment. So it's even more important that we do what we're doing at the moment. What have we learned so far? Well, we've learned quite a lot of things, actually. And uh, a lot of them, we need a few more cases to see if it's genuinely going to be the case. But it's certainly looking very exciting. First of all, I think we... We are well on the way to showing that when surgery is not an option, conservative management is more than reasonable. We absolutely need more cases to show this, to really uh, solidly show our outcome uh, and the percentage and the prognosis. But, you know, even the small numbers that we have at the moment is looking very, very promising. Uh, so certainly I think we're well on the way to, to showing this. Secondly, that we can highlight spinal cord swelling. It's something that we were hoping to be able to show and we've definitely been able to reliably show this spinal cord swelling on the MRI and we can actually measure it. And so hopefully we can come, start to, to, to come some of the way to quantifying that contusive injury, that bruising and, and the subsequent swelling on the MRI. And hopefully that will help us in the future decide which dogs absolutely require surgery. 
What's quite interesting as well is that it's quite well correlated with how severely affected the dogs are, which is entirely an academic thing. It doesn't particularly help us in a clinical sense, but academically, it's very interesting. It's also interesting because we've known for a very long time that compression doesn't correlate with clinical signs. So the fact that the uh, swelling does really is kind of implying that this bruising injury is perhaps the most important thing and the most important component actually of the disease process. Uh, and so whilst it's purely an academic thing, it's, it's feeding into a lot of the other things that we're doing and a lot of other things that we're learning. Uh, so it's still quite an important thing to have learned. I just wanted to show you how we do that. So uh, this is an MRI image. It's not a great image, unfortunately, um, but I wanted to show you two, one with the spinal cord swelling on the left and one with no swelling on the right. So starting with the one on the right, you can see these two white lines, one at the top and one at the bottom that are coming parallel to each other. And, uh, and that's the normal, normal spinal cord in the middle in between there that is not swollen. The one on the left, you can see there's a real cutoff in these lines and where there's that sort of blank space in between, that's where the spinal cord is swollen. Um, and you can see it's over quite a large section in this particular thing. What else have we learned? Well, we've learned that the nature of the disc material, the nature of the jam, simply changes over time. When we MRI them on day zero, if you like, and at 12 weeks, there's quite a significant difference in how that material looks. And I'm going to show you that with some kind of interactive cases in a minute. We've also shown that quite a lot of it can actually be removed from the body, but not always. That doesn't seem to happen in every case. Uh, we don't understand why it is that some, sometimes it's removed and sometimes it isn't. But we have shown that in some circumstances to quite a significant extent, it can be removed. Its removal is not necessary for recovery. So in some dogs where it has not been removed, they still do super, super well. Uh, and in other dogs where it is removed a little bit, they, they don't necessarily do so well, or they do do so well. There is no correlation between the two, um, but it's just interesting to know that certainly it can be removed from the body and it seems to be individual dependent. I wanted to show these two images just to show you this, how much disc material really can be removed uh, by the body in what is a relatively short period of time of only 12 weeks. So as you can see here, this is an MRI image. So if you imagine this dog's head is to our left, this bum is to our to the screen's right, uh, and we're looking sideways and we've kind of cut him down the middle. This bit here is a vertebra, this is a vertebra. The spinal cord is running here in the gray and this big black blob that is causing this sort of disruption of this gray line in the middle, that is the disc. And in this case, it's causing quite severe compression. So the spinal cord goes from being this thick here to being this thick here. It's, it's really quite severely compressed. And this was the same dog 12 weeks later. There's no longer a big black blob there. It's completely disappeared. And the dog has completely removed this disc material in the space of just 12 weeks, uh, which is pretty incredible uh, to go from. I can tell you that this dog's disc was a little bit over 90% compressive uh, and it went to below 5% in 12 weeks. That's pretty impressive. So as I said, I promised before that we would have a few interactive cases and, and uh, we've got, I think, three to go through all of which have kind of taught us a little bit something different. Uh, so this uh, little dog, there's a nice picture of her, which was very uh, nicely supplied by her owner uh, when she came to see us. So she was four years, 10 months. She had had a surgery four months before uh, and recovered completely following the surgery. Um, but then she, she went down again and she became completely unable to use her back legs over between 24 and 48 hours. Uh, and actually, when she presented to uh, the neurologist down on the south coast at Anderson Moore's, she had no deep pain perception at all in her back leg. So she would be a grade five. She would be in the most severely affected category. 
Um, and so in theory, she had only a 6% chance of recovery. Her MRI showed a T13L1 dissection. So essentially all that means is right in the middle of her back. It's exactly bang in the middle. Uh, and I've got a couple of images of it here. So where the red arrow points to, that is the disc extrusion. That's the bit that's causing the damage. And hers was relatively compressive. It was about 50% compressive. So she was then managed conservatively for 12 weeks. And we looked at her MRI and there's not really a huge amount of difference. We can see, okay, it looks a little bit clearer there. There's the disc material looks a bit more black, it looks a bit more organized, it looks a bit flatter, um, but otherwise it's pretty much the same, which you would think is maybe a little bit disappointing. Um, but I'm just gonna play this video here. And as you can see, she is doing fantastically well. She is walking really, really nicely. She was very, very comfortable. She was very, very happy. Um, and even since then, I'm just going to play that one more time for everybody. Uh, she's continued to improve since then. And I, I kept in touch with her owner and she actually now outruns her sister, another miniature adaptant who has never had intellectual disc disease in the past. And she is capable of outrunning her, uh, which just tells you how well she's doing, despite the fact that uh, this didn't really change over 12 weeks. My well, second case, this very handsome chap here. Uh, so he's a five year, four month male neutered mini dachshund. Uh, he progressed a little bit more slowly. So he progressed over around three days um, from just being a little bit off color. He was very lethargic, not wanting to jump, uh, and gradually became uncoordinated to the point where he was completely paralyzed in his back legs. And actually, uh, this is going to show that in the video here. So this is him before he came to us. This is about 24 hours before he came to us. And you can see uh, his mum is trying to, to, to kind of get him to move and nothing is really, really happening there. When he came to see us, he had some movement in his back legs, but it was very, very minimal. So he was a very severely affected His MRI showed an L3-4 extrusion, so it's a little bit further back. It's kind of in the middle of his abdomen uh, to give you an idea of where that is. And again, the red arrow is, is showing it there. And again, you can see it's it's quite sort of difficult to differentiate the bits on the MRI actually um, in these kind of early MRIs. And that's definitely a common feature of these, these first MRIs. Um, and again, his, his disc was, was relatively compressive. You can see actually on the right hand image that uh, this is the spinal cord here. Uh, and if this is the disc material, you can see that it's probably taking up around half of the space there. So uh, quite a significant compression. And after 12 weeks, this is him. He's doing super well. He walks almost normally. He's very, very happy to be going out. As you can see from the video, he's more than happy to be out and trotting around on the lead uh, and doing really very, very well. So you might think to yourself, well, the, the last dog who was doing that well, there was no real change on the MRI. Um, so it's probably going to be no change this time. Uh, but that certainly wasn't the case for him. As you can see, there's almost nothing to see on these MRIs. You're going to have to take my word for it that the red arrow is pointing to the same place that it was pointing to uh, on his first MRI, because really there's nothing there. We can see that on this image, the spinal cord is running here. It's running very nicely. There's no kind of interruption there. Uh, and here is the nice, beautiful round spinal cord exactly as it should be, not being compressed at all. Uh, and so, just looking at these two together, not only they certainly show that conservative management works for a lot of cases, but certainly they've shown that whilst this material can be removed uh, and can be changed over time, it doesn't seem to be necessary. You know, one has, has not removed any and one has removed a lot uh, and they've both done equally, equally well. One last case. So, this little one was a little bit older. She was a six-year-old six female neutered Daxi. 
uh, and she progressed from back pain to paralysis without deep pain sensation in 12 hours. So she deteriorated quicker than, than, than the other two that I'm showing you today. Um, and her MRI showed a T13 L1 disc extrusion. Uh, I don't have a picture of her, unfortunately. I just have a picture of her MRI. And you can see again, there's this sort of black blob there that's causing the problem. Um, and it's quite difficult to see the kind of margins there. Um, and again, it's in the mid region of the back, which is the most common place. So after 12 weeks, this is what her MRI looked like. So there's still some there, but it's nowhere near as bad as it was previously. There's still a little bit on the other view as well. So uh, if I point it out to you, it's just here uh, and, and here. So it's much less than it was before, uh, but still some there. But again, she was doing really very well. She wasn't too keen on walking today. It was very, very cold, which is why she's dressed like a bumblebee. And as you can see, she's walking incredibly well, especially considering that she was grade five only 12 weeks before that. Um, she's doing fabulously well. And she's continued to improve since then too. So just to kind of recap, I mean, it, all of those cases show us that, you know, there's, definitely a chance without surgery. If you go down the conservative management route, it's almost certainly a perfectly valid way to go when surgery is not an option. This material can be removed, but it doesn't seem to have to be. Um, and it's very variable how much it can be removed as well. Um, and those things are gonna help us deciding in the future. Certainly the fact that we know that contusive injury is perhaps more important and that Going in and scooping stuff out surgically is not the only way that this material is removed. It's, it's certainly very promising for us going forwards. And we're going to use that to kind of build a few criteria uh, so that hopefully once we get to uh, a few more cases, we'll start to be building some more robust criteria for, for how we're going to determine who needs surgery and who doesn't need surgery. But that's not everything that we're doing. That takes up a huge amount of, uh, of our time, but there are other projects that are on the go that uh, I just wanted to make everyone a little bit aware of. So firstly, we're hoping to develop a new definition of success. Um, so I'll come on to that in a second, what we mean by success and, and how we're hopefully changing that for the better. Uh, a colleague of mine called Teresa, who is uh, joining us this evening as well, uh, is looking at some disc analysis in the lab. She's doing some very, very clever stuff with that that is going to hopefully elucidate a little bit more about why this happens. Uh, and hopefully will also link up with the MRIs that I've just been showing you uh, to help build some of our criteria too. Uh, and also some gait analysis. So uh, this is just sort of various different measurements of how the dogs walk and hopefully uh, that will help us also uh, ties in with the, with the definition of success a little bit too. So what do we mean by success first and foremost? Well, currently success is defined as the ability to do 10 steps unaided, but any of you who have been through this in the past will know that a simple binary outcome for success doesn't really reflect how things go because there are lots of dogs out there who will be able to do 10 steps and they'll be wobbling all over the place and certainly couldn't do any more than 10 steps and yet there's other dogs who do 10 steps perfectly and could continue to do another 10 steps and another 10 steps and another 10 steps unaided with no problems and it seems kind of silly that we put them both into the same category just a yes or a no um, so we're hoping to change that really. What we wanted to do was we wanted to have a new definition that reflects the more continuous scale of improvement, more of a sliding scale. And if we were able to achieve that, then not only could we use it as a marker of success, we could also use it as an objective measurement as opposed to a subjective measurement of their improvement through the 12 weeks, which is quite important for us in this kind of COVID world where we can't see them very regularly, get hands on uh, and do lots of complicated measurements and complicated tests. It's important that we have something that's really simple, easy to do at home that we can do remotely, that we can use to, 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 to measure success and measure progress in an objective way. And, and the way that we're doing that is 50 step cycles unaided. So once dogs are able to do this, we ask them to do 50 step cycles and 
for a miniature dachshund that's around 12 meters and what we do is we film them and we count the number of times uh, a point above their hock touches the ground the number of times essentially they stumble uh, and that gives us a physical number of how they're doing and so the idea is that gradually they stumble less and less and a success would be stumbling zero times over 50 step cycles at the end that would be our total outcome but it also can be used as a sliding scale uh, where the lower the number the better just wanted to show you a video of us doing that so you've already seen a couple of videos of them doing it but uh, I wanted to show you one more. So she's slowly walking across 12 meters, which we've measured out on here. And then we count the number of times she stumbles. Uh, and, and, and this little girl, she didn't stumble at all. Uh, she was quite happy to, to keep going afterwards as well. She was quite keen to keep walking a little bit further. Um, and so she, she met our criteria of success of being able to do 50 step cycles unaided, very, very successfully. Secondly, the mineral content analysis. So this is what my colleague is doing, Teresa, with some very complicated things. So uh, what she does is she's kind of looking at this relationship between degeneration and calcification, so mineralization of the disc, and how potentially this can inform us and, and predict which disc is going to go, or even help us predict whether this material can be removed by the body, or does it impact upon the prognosis? It's, it's, it's really very clever stuff that she's doing. She's using a few different machines. I'm not going to pretend to know what they all do, um, but they're called FDIR, XRD and electron spectroscopy. Uh, and what she does is she takes the material removed from surgery and she compares discs that have you know, jam donuts that have been squeezed and those that haven't essentially to try to see if there's any difference between the mineral structure in each of those. Uh, and does that in some way relate with the degree of spinal cord damage? Uh, and she was telling me just yesterday that apparently uh, what she has found is that in both the jam donuts that have been squeezed and not squeezed, uh, that there is something called hydroxyapatite, which is the type of calcium found in your teeth and bones in both of them, but to a far greater extent in the jam donuts that have been squeezed. So potentially this is starting to add a few more of the missing pieces of the puzzle to explain why degeneration leads to uh, extrusion um, and why it's that disc that has gone and not the one next to it, uh, for example. So very, very exciting stuff. Uh, and uh, Hopefully she's going to have more to kind of show us all about that in the, in the relatively near future. Uh, for anyone who wants to go and read about that, uh, there's been some work done in human beings. Uh, and so this is a great article to, to kind of go to and, and have a look at. Lastly, text scan gate analysis. So this is a text scan map underneath, and essentially you have a series of them that dogs walk over, uh, and that's literally what it does. And what it does is it records the pressure, and you use the computer to then make some very clever measurements that give you various different information about how that dog is walking. And what we would like to do is to use this to take different measurements throughout the recovery phase of dogs who have undergone both surgical and medical management to try to compare the recoveries. But also we would like to try to understand why some dogs spinal walk and, and this might help us if we can get lots of normal dogs to go over the tech scan and really characterize a normal dachshund walk on here, um, then hopefully we can understand why some dogs spinal walk. Uh, and some dogs don't. Uh, inevitably, it's not going to give us all of the answer. There's multiple things that play into it, but hopefully it will get us some way to understanding it. Lastly, I know I didn't mention this in the further uh, thing, but I think it's important that we, we briefly mention it because it's something that's coming up in the sort of world of intervertebral disc disease in the near future. Um, and it's the intervertebral disc scoring scheme. So it's already around, it's already available, it's already available in the UK, but it's been much more extensively done in Scandinavia. Uh, and what they do is they take dogs between the ages of two and four, they x-ray the entire spine, and they count the number of calcifications. So essentially you're looking for white uh, dots on the x-ray uh, in between the vertebra. And there's been quite a strong correlation between 
the number of discs that you see calcified at this age and the risk of future extrusions. It's also been shown that the, the number of calcifications is actually passed on, it's hereditary, so will form the basis potentially of sort of breeding recommendations as well. Uh, and, and this is going to go live relatively soon, uh, I believe. I'm sure Ian can give the specific date if anyone would like to know, uh, and any of the specifics about how this is going to work. But essentially, that's what it is. And as I said before, it, it gives breeding recommendations, uh, and we put them in grey. This is a really great paper that I've just put a little reference there to uh, that goes through the radiographic scoring scheme and how it can be useful. It's, it's a really great reference for anyone who, who is interested and would like to go and read that. That's it from me. So I'd just like to say thank you, everyone, first of all, for listening. Thank you, Ian, for organising this talk. Uh, thank you to Daxon Health UK for their funding and their, their, their time. Uh, thank you to Paul Freeman and Kate Hughes for uh, supervising the study to our other funders, the Kennel Club, Pet Savers and Tebs Foundation, uh, and also to everyone who's participated in this study so far. Thank you for putting your trust in us and, and, and being a part of it. It's uh, really, we're, we're really grateful for everyone who comes to see us. Um, so, so thank you. Uh, and once again, thank you everyone for listening. If you have any questions, uh, 